So let's move on to the solution. So for part A, I'm just going to write out the answer. There's really not much going on. You have two point charges, so you add up the potential from the two points. So I'm just going to write out the answer. So the principle behind this answer is the principle of superposition. You just add up the two potentials. So there you have it. So this is the answer for part A. So part B, there's obviously a lot more of mathematics going on. And here you need a bit of calculus. So I'm just going to write out the diagram. So in part B, we have a line charge. And then we're trying to find the potential at this point, which is at a distant z from the center of this line charge. So this line over here has a charge density, a uniform charge density of lambda, and it has a length of 2L. So I'll just label this axis as L. So when we integrate, we're going to integrate in terms of DL, so along this direction from here to here. So the next step is to determine the integral. So once again, we use this principle of superposition. The total potential at this point is going to be equal to the sum of the individual potential contributed by every single point on this line charge. So we have lambda times dl, so the charge density times the length. So this is going to be the amount of charge. And this is, is going to be divided by the length. So we're considering the length of dl over here. So the amount of charge here, it contributes to a, a potential that's related to this distance over here. So we need to divide, we need to divide this expression by the distance, because that's the formula for potential. And this distance is going to be equal to l squared plus z squared, the square root. So I'm going to let this length here be l. So uh, that's going to be the the distance. So using that, we see that the denominator here is going to be L squared plus Z squared. And then since we're doing the integral in terms of DL, it's going to go from negative big L to big L because the length is 2L. So the next step to s in solving this is to use substitution. So we're going to let, so we're going to let L be equal to Z tangent theta. And this is going to help us simplify the, exp the expression quite a bit. So using the standard procedure for substitution, so dl we get z secant square theta d theta. And then for the denominator, we get we get a z squared 1 plus tangent square theta. So that is actually equal to, so 1 plus tangent square theta is actually equal to secant square theta. And you can prove this using the fact that sine square theta plus cosine square theta is equal to 1. And then the next thing we need to, to do is to determine the upper and lower bounds. So for this case, the lower bound is going to be some theta such that I'm going to call that uh, call the upper bound alpha. So the upper bound is some value such that the tangent of this upper bound is going to be equal to L divided by Z. So I'll just this is the definition of my uh, upper bound, so I'll just write alpha. And you see that it goes from negative L to L. So for the negative case, so for the lower bound, so the lower bound, it's going to be such that it's equal to negative L over Z. And thanks to the fact that tangent is a is a not function, you see that the lower bound is actually equal to the negative of alpha. So in the end, the bound actually, actually goes from negative alpha to alpha. So next step, let, let, let us just simplify this slightly. So you have a Z squared square root, so the Zs, they cancel out. You have a secant square, you have a square root, so you have one secant. And then you have two secants up there, so one of them, they cancel each other out. So we're going to have the lambda, I'm just going to pull that out. And then we're going to have a secant. And it's going to go from negative alpha to alpha. And so the next step, we have a rather simple problem of integrating secant theta. And that's actually going to be equal to secant theta plus tangent theta. You can look this up. And if you want to prove this, you can actually multiply the numerator and the denominator by secant theta plus tangent theta, and then apply substitution. You'll see that the numbers work out by themselves. And then substituting the upper and lower bounds, you get secant alpha plus tangent alpha divided by, so secant negative alpha is going to be equal to 
secant alpha because secant is an even function. And then plus tangent negative alpha. Tangent negative alpha is actually equal to negative tangent alpha because tangent is an odd function. So now we need to, for us to get the complete answer, we need to get rid of alpha. So alpha is just this auxiliary constant that I defined to simplify the number of symbols I need to write. Remember, al alpha is defined such that the tangent of alpha is equal to L over Z. So you see that alpha is such a number where this triangle uh, happens. So alpha is such an angle that creates this kind of triangle. So if this is L, this is Z, then this line must be square root of L squared plus Z squared. So substituting the values in, secant alpha is equal to L squared plus Z squared divided by Z. That's the definition. Tangent alpha is L over Z. And then you get something similar in the denominator. And then I think you see where this is heading to. So we can just simplify the expression by getting rid of the Z's. So you get L squared plus Z squared plus L divided by L squared plus Z squared minus L. So I got rid of the absolute value sign because this expression has to be positive because square root of L squared plus something is always going to be larger than just L by itself. So this expression here is the potential.